Welcome back to another episode of the Vision Hunters podcast. I'm your host, Cody Story, and this is episode number 15, part one of two, staying connected to the natural world during the digital revolution with Daniel Vitalis. Real quick, before we get into today's show, new episodes of the Vision Hunters podcast are released every Wednesday on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, or if you want to watch the show, you can head over to my Cody Story YouTube channel. The spelling there is C-O-D-Y-S-T-O-R-E-Y. If you've been following along with each episode of the Vision Hunters podcast, you know that the topics my guests and I talk about are related to business, branding, sales, marketing, and entrepreneurship, which is one of the reasons I'm stoked to have Daniel Vitalis on today's show. He's an extremely successful business owner and entrepreneur, but I also want you to know he has a way of viewing the world, which will get you to consider new ideas and stretch your thinking. These two episodes with Daniel go beyond entrepreneurship. They dive deep into the question, how can we stay connected to the natural world during the digital revolution? Some of the things discussed in today's episode are why life is not over at 40 and why it's actually when men hit their peak, how to stay connected to the planet living in a digital world, how zooming out to look at the movers and shakers of the world can expose their agenda. Are we being tricked into the digital world in our packed mega cities? What's in store for us in the future? Daniel's legacy project, what commercial food has in common with glory holes, how our species is being dumbed down by living in artificial realities, transhumanism and the twisted ideas of some of the iconic heroes of our time, the domestication of humans and the role of humans in the ecosystem. Of course, there is more. And of course, this is just part one of part two. So I encourage you to check out part two next week in the way to find out more in terms of what is in store for you, well, you're going to have to listen to episode number 15, part one and two with Daniel Vitalis. Alrighty, folks, it is time to dive in. We have an incredible guest with us today, and I've been looking forward to this interview for quite some time now. So Daniel Vitalis, welcome to the Vision Hunters podcast. Dude, I'm so excited to be here and the congratulations on the show. And on the move and uh, what seems like a big life transformation, I'm just really happy for you and getting to kind of see, at least through the social media perspective, what you've been up to it <laughs> makes my heart sing, man, because last time, you know, we hung out was in Los Angeles, hmm. which mm -hmm. I think at this point is like a hellhole really for a lot mm -hmm. of the people that are there. I mean, not for everybody, but uh, that'd be a hard place to be right now. And uh, where, where are you in Colorado? Uh, well, I'll first start by saying yes. LA was a very difficult place to be in. And yeah. it's been a couple year journey just to be able to make the move out of yeah. there. But we are now in Idaho. Idaho. Oh, even better, man. Sorry, mm -hmm. Coloradans. But uh, yeah, dude, that's awesome. I mean, I'm just stoked, like seeing all that wood behind you, you know, mm. and being like, ah, it must feel good. So congratulations. Dude, talk about a different way of life. And yeah. it's the it's similar to the way of life I grew up in, but took for granted had no idea what I had access to, um, including, you know, growing up in the mountains as a kid, but also having a father that was a cowboy, you know, he just, that's how he grew up. That was the world he came from. And he tried to share it with us, as you know, Luke as well. Um, but, you know, we were wild as hell and we had other ideas. And now looking yeah. back, I'm like, damn, I've been having conversations since I moved out here with him. And I can just hear when he talks, like, he tried to help us move in that direction, yeah. but he just, you know, couldn't get through to us in terms of like the change in the world. Like I started becoming interested in skateboarding and snowboarding and I went that way and it had nothing to do with per se yeah. hunting, fishing, foraging, living off the land, staying connected to the nature other than riding down the slopes. Yeah. But um, he really had so much knowledge to pass yeah. on. And we did, but not it's neat as you return to it later in life, you know, how old are you now? I am 39. Cool. So I got this uh, mentor that says to me, hunting mentor, and he says, Dan, your life don't even start till you're 40. 
you know? <laughs> and I, I'm understanding that now that it's like about when you turn 40 is when you really start to hit a stride. There's this thing, um, you know, I hunt and gather as a, one of my big passions and my brand and my TV show and everything mm -hmm. wild fed. And, um, there's this idea about indigenous hunter gatherers, you know, in the anthropology that a hunter starts to really hit his stride around age 40. That's when he starts to get good. Wow. Like, like reliably good. And he can actually start to really provide consistently because your body is not in the decline phase yet, but your mind and your experience has hit that point where you're at peak physical, peak mental. And that's like where you really start to jam. And so when I look back, I'm 42. Uh, when I look back, I'm like, oh man, I've been, I was a kid up until a couple of years ago and, and I mm. didn't really, you know, so it all starts to come together. And, and my point being, um, you guys, you're returning to ideas and it's the right, this is the way of things. It's like, there's this biblical idea that like raise a child up in something mm. and they will return to it later in life. Mm. And so the blessings of that, you know, early exposure you got are going to pay dividends now. And it's all in right time. You know, you, you're going to benefit so much from all of the stuff you did by going away from it. And you're going to bring all that back to it and merge them. And that's, mm -hmm. that's evolution. So, you know, I think it's great. Dude, just it's, it's, is a very, I'm having an interesting feeling as you say that I don't feel like you're prophesizing. It's just like, or trying to sound prophetic, but it's hitting me on a very deep level. Like I started getting chills in my body and I just had this really good sensation kind of come over my body just hearing that I come from <laughs> putting quite a bit of pressure on myself and you know beating myself up and self-condemnation in terms of you know these evolutions or these phases yeah. we go you're, through you're good at that too <laughs> oh my god dude I was yeah. talking to a guest the other day he's like yeah condemning oneself is a real big waste of time and it's like man I wish I could just you know, shut that off with just a switch, but it's been there in the background. But hearing that at age 40, because one thing my dad has kind of talked to me about through the years has been like, you know, every seven years, a man goes through a big change. Right. And that could even include like careers or businesses. And yeah. here I am, I'm at this very pivotal turning point in my life. As you know, um, last time we saw each other, I still had story fitness in LA, yeah. closed that business down two years, two years ago. And I've been floating around in outer space in total darkness, you know, not yeah. knowing what's what, what am I going to do next? It's just yeah. been facing the unknown, the abyss. Yeah. Yeah. And here we are, I wound yeah. up, like you said, coming back to where I came from. And it yeah. just, it really does feel so good um, to return back. In the tarot deck, there's, which is like a collection of the archetypes of the human psychological experience. And in the major arcana, there's a card called the hanged man. And it's a dude hanging. Traditionally, it's a dude hanging from his feet upside down. All the coins are falling out of his pocket. Mm. And he's sort of like dangling. And the idea is like, when you hit one of those moments where you're just like, what am I doing? You're just floating and you're like stuck in limbo. And it's so hard to be in that place. But that's like, the, that's probably how a caterpillar feels right before it emerges from the chrysalis. Like, what am I doing? Mm. I've just been sitting in this, you know, <laughs> wrapped in this thing for weeks. Like, what, what is the point of this? And then you come out and it's like, oh, I got wings in that process. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of good in that, but it's painful when you're in it. Yeah, bro. And the other painful thing that's come with it, we were talking about it before we uh, started recording, which is, you know, I've been putting off my whole life. Like it first started in the educational system. Like I did not fit there. I did not belong there sitting in, you know, cement walls, with these just square little cutout windows. Like I just, I put that off. I mean, I dropped out when I was a junior. I was like, peace out. I'd already not been going to school because I was able to get out and only have to go to school three days a week because I could go up on the mountain and practice snowboarding the other two days. So I really didn't go, but I put that off. And now I feel like here I am through my adult years, I've been putting off this whole digital revolution. And mm -hmm. that's been a kind of a painful acceptance experience for me. Yeah. And, you know, I feel like maybe you come from a similar place inside yeah. where yeah. there's like this inner knowing of we're leaving, you know, almost like leaving the planet, stepping into a new world. And there's this inner, you know, I don't know, if, how do you say the word yearning, this, this inner calling, calling me back 
mm-hmm. in saying, don't go, don't go, stay here, go back, go back to nature. Yeah. But yet, I think you said it's almost as if we've been um, uh, forced or pushed into yeah. and there's like no turning back now. Like, what has that experience been like for you as far as having this inner knowing, but yet the world is changing around you and it's just yeah. the way it is? It's changing fast too. Yeah, I just want to go back and validate what you said first about school. You know, my, my wife's an educator and she's worked, she worked 18 years in the school, public school system. And uh, I've come to appreciate a lot of aspects of the school system that I didn't before mm-hmm. because it wasn't working well for me. But now I've come to understand that it does work well for some people. But when I met you, my impression of you is you're like a somatic genius. And it must be painful to be in these rigid uh, sort of intellectual structures mm-hmm. when you're a somatic person and your brilliance only gets to be expressed in what competitive sports, which you don't strike me as a competitive athlete. You mm-hmm. strike me as a person who's a competes with himself athlete. Mm-hmm. So you're an athlete, but then here's this str- like, what, what, what is there for you in the school system? The, the sitting still thing is going to kill you yeah. and you can't physically express ex- unless you want to go into the machismo <laughs> of it. That's not your thing. So yeah. it's like stuck there, man, it's hard, you know? And yeah. I, I think we're, we're different a little bit, but we're similar in that way. And that I, I also had a really hard time with it. Um, but anyway, now uh, I'm watching the transformation of the world in a, in an extremely rapid acceleration that, that you can see the trend lines. If you go back, it's like, okay, this has been a, since the, the, I guess the industrial revolution, there's been, this thing's been ticking, but it's, it's, you know, of course it's that exponential curve, like the hockey stick thing where we're right now in this parabolic portion of it and the world's changing <laughs> mm-hmm. where you could get up and read the headlines every day and be like the world changed again the world changed again the world changed again now i've been trying to zoom out as much as possible because when you're looking at the minutia the details are overwhelming and they're confusing excuse me my computer's going to overheat here i'm going to set it up it's all good fine ice block here <laughs> hear that fan um it's changing really really rapidly and the headlines almost don't make sense but when you zoom out and you go where are the people who who are the movers and shakers of the world where do they want to bring the world to i think that's when all the change starts to make sense you're like oh there's like agendas playing out here and they're gonna they're gonna tell you whatever they want to tell you day to day in order to affect the change they want and it might not make sense mm-hmm. until you zoom out mm-hmm. but part of what's happening is the world's being pushed into the online environment and it almost doesn't matter us, you know, we're gen X maybe, or, or very early millennials right in that cusp. Mm -hmm. It almost doesn't matter if we resist it or don't resist. And it's not for us. It's for, it's the next generation. It's generation Z that's going to make, that's going to, they're already embraced the changes. Mm. There are, mm-hmm. They're the ones that are going to live in the digital world. The pain, part of the pain that I think we're experiencing is that we were raised in a, in a analog <laughs> world. We have one foot in the analog world. And I remember, dude, I have this memory of a kid rolling up on a BMX bike with a cell phone. I was probably, I had to have been like 10 or 11. And oh, okay. it was like one of those saved by the bell shoebox sized things. He had it strapped on his bike, you know, uh-huh. like his top tube of his bike. And I mean, it was a huge thing. And I remember it was the first time I was like a phone outside of the house. Like what, you know, mm. um, and watching what's happened since then. Mm-hmm. Or you remember that probably you remember some pretty early video games. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Super oh, yeah. cheesy stuff. And you look at it now and it's like, it's mind blowingly real. Mm-hmm. And at the speed that it's moving, you, it's not hard to see. Oh, people will soon have a hard time. They'll probably within 10, 20 years, there'll be people who maybe don't even know that there's really an outside world anymore. Mm. You know, mm. it's one thing to be like in your mom's, you know, let's say you're in your, your bedroom, your childhood bedroom at home, but you're in your like twenties and all you do all day is play video games and go down and get some cereal or whatever. That's pretty immersed, but I'm talking a whole nother level where people might not even fully understand how much of a natural and outside world there is because the way the narrative's moving now is like humans should are bad for nature humans need to stay out of nature humans le- need to leave no trace in nature humans are using too much resources humans are bad for the mm. natural world we need to go into the digital realm and erase our presence in nature 
And so the trend is going to be towards, there's a bit of a distortion in the trend right now because of COVID and a lot of people leaving the cities, but the trend is going to be towards sort of stack and pack mega cities where people don't have the freedom to explore nature the way they do today, unless we make some tremendous changes. That's just how I would project the trend. So I see my work as in my legacy project is to reintroduce as many people to nature mm. as I can mm. in a meaningful, intimate way. So I don't mean like a quick nature walk, but what I th- I'm so into food and I, and I, it's not just nutrition to me, food, which I'll define for your listeners, how I define it anyway, is food is, is basically body parts. Mm. And this is something that I just think people rarely actually grasp unless somebody says it to them. But if you looked at a plate, it'd be like, oh, broccoli, what's that? Well, that's an inflorescence of, of a, of a brassica oleracea plant. So that's the flower. It's a body part of that plant. Mm -hmm. Okay. I got some carrots. What's that? Well, that's the roots of that plant. It's a body part. Okay. I got a chicken wing. What's that? It's a body part. Okay. There's some mushrooms. What are those fruit bodies of a mycelia? It's, it's body parts. We eat bodies Mm. and body parts, Mm. which means we eat other entities. Mm -hmm. And we rarely know those entities. That is so weird to me because if you think about food, it's like, this is this really intimate thing because you put it inside your body and then you become it. It becomes Mm -hmm. you, I should say, actually. Mm -hmm. So that's like pretty deep stuff. And if you're going to do that to all these different species, but then maybe not even have any connection to who those species are. And I say who very intentionally, because we like to think of them as it's. But they're not. They're self-determining individuals, Mm. whether they're plant life or fungal life or algal life or animal life. These are living things with their own genetic lineages, almost always older than ours. In other words, they've been denizens of the earth longer than us. Mm. Mm -hmm. They've been, their agendas for their life began before there was homo sapiens. Mm -hmm. You know, carrots, not in their domesticated form, but in their wild form, the plant here, Queen Anne's Lace, I can see it in my yard right now. That plant has been around since before people and it's been doing its thing. It's its agenda is not to serve humans. It's got its own reasons for being. Mm -hmm. Now it's okay for us to eat them. I celebrate that we do, but to not know them and eat them is sort of like, uh, what is this? The glory hole of eating? Mm. Like, you know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. how, um, remote of an experience imagine like making Mm -hmm. love with someone you never actually meet or see Mm -hmm. like that might be some people's kink but most of us need more than that right Mm -hmm. and the idea to eat like plants you've never seen in person or animals you've you know when i became a fisherman it was really powerful for me the first time i saw a haddock it was like goodness i've been eating this animal my whole life Mm -hmm. never seen it before like good to meet you i'm partially made of you and i've never met you weird, right? Mm -hmm. So when I talk about reintroducing people to nature, I used to do it in a more vague way. And I've gotten much more dialed in because I'm like, I want people to have no choice but to walk away going, I now know someone new that I didn't know. And uh, whether it's a plant or an animal or fungi or an algae, and I'm made out of them. And that gives me a new, um, uh, if you imagine almost like a, a network a webbed network of relationships on the planet. Now you have one to the natural world because most of us only have them to each other and to artificial things. So we have connections to amazon.com and we have connections mm-hmm. to the post office and we have connections to the supermarket and all these like art artific- computers and websites and all these artificial things. But very infrequently do we have them to the things that actually we require to live. So by when you have those connections, they quickly become more important than synthetic experiences Mm -hmm. and they're much more fulfilling. So um, like something I like to point out, and I think you'll really get this because of your, the type of thinker you are, if you were to be out in a natural environment and you started to like look around at the complexity, anything that you picked up would be complex, infinitely down and infinitely up. So it's like, If I'm standing outside, it just expands infinitely out into space. And Mm -hmm. if I were to pick up a leaf and I look close, I'd be like, oh, look at all the veins in that. And then I'd be like, Mm -hmm. oh, look at those little individual tissue structures. And then if I could get a microscope, Mm -hmm. it'd just be infinite down, right? Of like Mm -hmm. the complexity. Now put you in that schoolroom, right? Yeah. And think about how information poor it is. It's actually starving for information. The walls are just bland. 
Mm -hmm. and the floors are perfectly flat and there's no terrain and there's no texture. It's, it's actually missing all the elements mm -hmm. in the sense of like earth, water, air, and fire, right? It's stale, mm -hmm. stagnant air. Mm -hmm. The only fire is the electricity coursing through the walls, mm -hmm. right? There's, if there's a plant in the room, there might be a little soil. Otherwise it's like completely devoid of earth, mm -hmm. right? There's no moving living water in the space. It's like a dead environment and it's information poor. So in the same way that in the dark ages, people didn't know how to read and uh, they were illiterate and they were, they were a reflection of the lack of information that their minds had been fed. And that kept us in a, in a dark ages until the so-called enlightenment. Mm -hmm. Similarly, a video game might look complex, but it's actually infinitely less complex than just stepping out into your backyard outside. Mm. And so sadly, people are, are dumbing themselves down because they're spending so much time in a lack of information and everything around them is artificial and created by people. And that's really sad because when you step outside, man, to me, atheists are very arrogant. I find it a very arrogant position, the idea that because the, the position ends up being that the human mind is the most complex thing in the universe. It's like, wow, that's, first of all, I don't think that's true. Mm -hmm. and second, it's a lot of hubris. Cause when I step outside, I go, I don't know who the creator is specifically, mm -hmm. but I didn't create this and no one I know did. This mm -hmm. is way outside of us. This is way bigger. And that's humbling. And I worry that in almost a Luciferian sense, that when people spend all their time in human created worlds, as they're going to be soon in these digital immersive digital worlds, mm -hmm. the, who's the creator there? People. Mm. That's essentially the Luciferian doctrine mm. where we want to be the God. Mm -hmm. And what I love about uh, how humans lived before this stuff was wherever you look in the world, people had different spiritual traditions and paths, but they all recognized that <laughs> they weren't the source of the creation yeah. and the whole Bible. It's all old. The ancient part of it, the old Testament is constantly the story of humans thinking they're God and then bringing destruction down upon themselves through their own hubris and then coming, crawling back saying they're sorry. And then repeating it again, as soon as they get on their feet again, and mm -hmm. we're doing it in the biggest way right now. So, God damn, dude. so as you watch the world bifurcate, as you've got all these people going into a fully digital immersive human world, yeah. and you've got these other people that are like, man, I'm just feeling called to something real, something with substance, something natural. I don't want to be in control. I want to, I want to experience the creation, not be the creator. And so, um, at the end of the day, that's why I actually am doing what I'm doing. It's not really about like, oh, it's so cool to eat venison. It's cool mm -hmm. to eat venison, but it's mm -hmm. it's got all this subtext. Yeah. Wow, dude. <clears throat> or like oh what my. animal head I can put on the wall or whatever. You know, it's mm -hmm. like about a lot more than that. I, I kind of figured this was going to happen because of how challenging it was for me to start like outlining questions for today's show. But it's so great because it, it gets me to see things from another perspective. But yet those things also feel like they're within me. I was going to say, they must feel like, I feel you like know. what I'm talking about there is something that everybody can kind of see is happening, whatever side of it mm -hmm. they fall on. It's like, cause, cause if you're into transhumanism, which I would, which to me is of, of, a veiled kind of Luciferianism. So it's, um, it looks good on the surface. When I say transhumanism, I mean the idea that we're going to transcend our physicality, create the singularity event, bring the artificial intelligence in, fully summon the demon and um, create self-intelligent replicating machines. And we're going to, we're going to upload ourselves into that world. If that sounds crazy to you, you got to understand, not you specifically, but mm -hmm. somebody listening, it's mm -hmm. like, if that sounds totally insane to you, take a look at who's running the world right now. Cause that's what these folks are into, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of what they're all into. And, mm -hmm. and the, we're at a point now where we're sort of like unelected billionaire oligarch tech people are shaping the social and political and economic landscape. Mm -hmm. And those people are definitely into that. Mm -hmm. You know, look at some of our cultural iconic heroes, like, like just listen to Elon Musk for a minute. What's he actually telling you? Well, he's telling you he wants to put a chip in your brain to interface you with the machines. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, he'll tell you that AI is summoning the demon. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? He wants to what? Like integrate mm -hmm. you with the demon? Like, what is this? Mm -hmm. And it's actually like a religion. Yeah, no, this is, this is wild. And 
based on my little knowledge of Elon Musk or whatever, it's as if we're trying to get out of here. We're trying to right. leave planet Earth. Leave Earth. Leave Earth. Yeah. So thank you for that. So that would be, um, again, I think it's this, it's this hubris thing because there's something to me. So when I'm in the natural world, I am so humbled by its beauty and complexity. I just want to have the opportunity to experience living in it. Mm -hmm. The idea that I would be like, this isn't enough. We need to get out of here and go to somewhere dead and start over. It's that thing of, I want to be God. I want to be the creator. I want to be the one who designs reality because the reality that we're in is not good enough. I wonder sometimes as the very few but still intact remaining indigenous traditions of the world when those people look at what we're trying to do if they get you know if they are understanding these conversations you know if they're understanding what some of these folks are trying to accomplish i wonder what they think because it's such a different perspective like mm -hmm. people's who have an intact because if you look at our lineages right like I, i'm curious you know for you I, I can't trace myself very far back i mean i have ancestors <laughs> that came here from italy and from uh yeah. ireland yep. and i have no idea who i'm related to in the past we are uh, cultural orphans so i have an opportunity this year i'm going out to standing rock um north and south dakota mm. for uh, the show and for a hunt i've been invited out there cool. and um I'm thinking about those folks who can trace their lineage back to the crossing of the Bering Strait, essentially. Mm -hmm. When humans who were in Asia walked across from Siberia to what's today Alaska and mm -hmm. came into this continent, right? Like mm -hmm. they they may not like be able to say, oh yeah, that was Jim who came across or whatever. I don't saying it's like that, but they, <laughs> yeah, yeah. they know themselves back. Yeah. But most of us here, we don't know even who our families were. Most of us. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, there are those who do, but there's like an orphaning of our people. So we don't, we're not making decisions based on or honoring our ancestry because our ancestry was erased. Mm. So we're sort of here like, oh, I don't know who I am. Mm -hmm. I guess the world's our playground or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I'm very excited to spend some time with folks who whose decisions are made from a place of honoring, you know, those 10,000 or more years of ancestral tradition. And I'm very curious to see what they think of going to Mars Dude. or what they think of uploading your consciousness into a machine. Dude, weird. So weird. What was coming to mind as you were saying that is there's two things. One is now that I'm integrating myself more into the wilderness like i think i remember on a podcast with luke you talked about nature and you're like dude nature is everywhere whether you're in the house or you're outside of the house so i like to say it as the wilderness when yeah, i'm out yeah. in the mountains yeah now i'm in idaho and when i say i'm out in the wilderness i'm out in the goddamn wilderness yeah there right. ain't nobody around this ain't a hike up on some you know little hill to the hollywood hills sign you know to hollywood like this ain't a mm -hmm little hike when there's a bunch of people around right mm -hmm. like this isn't going to even um we call them national park with a bunch of people around i'm talking like we're out there ain't nobody there it's just us the uh, earth the plants yeah, yeah. and the animals now yeah. living in the city for 15 years and now coming out to this level of wilderness because i i feel like it's a different level of wilderness compared to what i described when we think of when you live in the city what it's like to go outside but I have this immediate, almost like a reaction. And I think it would have been different had I stuck by my father's side when I was a child. But because I didn't go that deep into the wilderness with him and gain that depth of knowledge, when I'm out there now at 39 years old, I, I love it. I feel alive. And at the same time, there's also this fear yeah that comes up within me that i am out of my element however it's also the element i come from right but yet i don't even know it mm -hmm. and now i'm actually just facing these fears within myself whether it's me going on my daily swim into the river and now i'm in the water and i can't see anything and the water's flowing fast but yet I love the way the cold makes me feel. 
So I have to actually see the fear and then relax into it and know and trust that everything is okay. It's just a matter of me not knowing because I haven't lived in this at that level. So as I get out in the wilderness, it's the same thing in terms of like, I'm a, we are, I think what we call apex predators as humans. Yeah. Like I'm not really, you know, anthropological or whatever. I don't even know if that's the right word, but you get where I'm going here. Like, even though I could be viewed as, and I am a predator, there's other predators out there. So when I'm up in the woods, like being in the water is one thing. Like, I feel like I'll be, I'll be straight up. I feel like a beaver is going to like swim out of somewhere and like gnaw on my fucking leg or something. Like, it's just, <laughs> yeah. it's weird because I haven't, yeah. you know, Yeah, of course, man. and so I try to see how long I can stay in that water and relax into it. But I now also, once I get out into the woods, I'm not water, but I'm out there and I know there's bear. Like we have in Idaho, we do have black bear. There are, you know, a little bit of grizzly here and there, not a ton, but then they had the integration of gray wolf from Alaska or no Canada into idaho but before it was just cats too i'd imagine yeah cats timber wolf yeah cougar um coyote the little guys so as i'm i'm experiencing this going up there with my fiance we love being out there but as a man i'm also a protector and i'm just like okay here we are and now what so it's like the way i want to connect this is to where you were going it's like I haven't fully learned even how to live in the wilderness. And then if we put it in the context of, you know, talking about the powers that be, we haven't even learned how to live in the wilderness, but yet we want to leave it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the disconnect. That's the thing I'm having a hard time understanding, but yet we can grow up in it and not even ponder those ideas or think about that. So I don't well, know like, if think that about, makes think sense. Think about but... like um, you brought up the, the wolves, right? And you know my thing. I talk a lot about how dogs are domesticated wolves mm-hmm. and how, you know, it'd be probably really similar. It's such a good metaphor because, you know, I, I see how when it starts to get dark out, my dog wants to come in the house. Mm. When the coyotes are ripping outside, she gets a little nervous. Like she hears that and she, does, she wants to come inside. Mm-hmm. She's a wolf but she doesn't know anything about being a wolf anymore. She's too domesticated. Mm. Now, human beings have got to this point where our, in our natural undomesticated form, we are a type of apex predator on the landscape. Now, Mm. we're a unique one. We don't go toe-to-toe with bears and win. We are apex predators because of our minds and these really great digits we have and in our our physical skill set and our technologies. Homo sapiens have always lived with technology. So lest anyone's confused about this who's hearing me, Uh, There was never a time where modern humans, and that goes back 300,000 years, in our modern form, our species, there was never a time where we were wild like um, we would think of most animals. So the very first human already had fire, already had weapons, because all the species of hominin before us had those too. Humans have always been technological. We were born with fire. We didn't invent fire later. Homo erectus taught us fire. Homo habilis taught Homo erectus. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. It goes back before our species. So we're a very unique species in that when we, even though we're an apex predator, we do it through technology and, and, uh, and, and our mental capability. But that said, we've been living so domesticated that I hate to I hate to just bring, I know that matrix analogy is so the movie is so like worn out, but <laughs> you remember when they wake Neo up, he's like, actually, he thinks he's living in the world, but he's living in a tank and he's just hooked up to the machine and him, like all the rest of the pink bodied hairless bald humans that are in tanks, having a mental projection of a real world are actually just living inside this like embryonic fluid. Right. Mm-hmm. Do you remember this movie? Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. they wake him up and it's, he has to deal with, oh my God, the real world. It's not what he thought. It's actually ugly and war-torn and beat up and burned and scorched. And, oh, I thought it was this other thing, right? Mm -hmm. We're sort of like that right now. It's like you get brought back into the natural world and it's like, oh, the real world. Because I I do this distinction with people and it's an important one in relationship to what you said about how nature is everywhere, because that's true. Mm -hmm. But But the distinction to make, so people will like to say natural and unnatural. And this is not helpful because what's unnatural? It's like 
people have made ar arguments for me. Well, a space shuttle is natural because it comes from, it was built out of stuff that came from nature. So what's unnatural is a nuclear power plant unnatural. Well, we got to got the uranium out of the ground. Like everything's technically natural. So mm -hmm. I don't use that distinction because it's not helpful. I use artificial and, and uh, natural. So artificial is the word, the root word is art. And art is something that's made with human hands, shaped by human will. Mm. And when we find something in the ground that people made, we call it an artifact mm -hmm. because it's artificial. Because artificial means shaped by human will and shaped by human hands. So if you went out into the, the wilderness there and you picked up a piece of flint off the ground, mm -hmm. that would be a natural object. If you found an arrowhead that was made of that same piece of flint, that would be artificial because mm -hmm. it was made by people. So its substrate is actually natural, but it's now bears the mark of human will upon it. It's artificial. Mm -hmm. So when we live in the city, everything around us is artificial. Every single thing around us, man. It's like every building, every surface, you could be like, that tree's natural. It's like, no, somebody planted that tree and that's not a natural tree. That's a agricultural tree. That's a domesticated tree or a product of horticulture. Well, that dog's natural. It's like, no, that that's a wolf that's been shaped by humanity's breeding programs mm. into a chihuahua. That's yeah. not natural. Well, what about this apple that I got at the store? It's like, no, that's a domesticated cloned apple. All apples that you eat from the store are clones. N you've actually been living like Neo in the Matrix. You've been living in a fully artificial world. Well, mm -hmm. when you get put back oh. in your natural environment, it sure doesn't feel like your environment. It feels yeah. very threatening until we find out that until we eat a beaver <laughs> and we find out <laughs> that funny. a beaver's a good tasting vegetarian rodent. Yeah. They're probably a little scary, man. And like yeah. all that stuff is scary. So, so piece by piece, we have to reintegrate ourselves into the natural world. Now, the mm -hmm. biggest threat here to the natural world is that when we are not living in it and we're living in our artificial world, the natural world seems like a threatening place. Now, let me give you some evidence. Look at the number of TV shows that are about people who suddenly are out in the natural world and have to get back to the safety of the artificial world. We love mm -hmm. shows like that. Yeah. Alone, Naked and Afraid, Dual Survivor, Bear Grylls, like all these shows are about these cultural iconic heroes that can survive outside oh my gosh what a revolutionary thing it's like we God, all damn, come good. from that son isn't that weird because yeah i was talking to one of the winners of uh the show alone um, yeah i love that show by the way and right that's amazing so you know that you know you know jordan who got the moose um, yeah yeah and we lived with the the folks in siberia yeah so i was talking he, to him the, he had his talking, fat taken from him countless by a wolverine. times yeah killed that wolverine with a hatchet dude oh dude. my god he's he's a bad dude anyway i was talking to him the other day and i was asking him you know what do you think about the idea that you're a celebrity survivalist that you're a celebrity in this artificial culture for being able to do what humans should just be able to do. Imagine if you were a celebrity for being able to walk or you were a celebrity for being able to speak. You'd be like, wow. what? Everybody can do this, you know? But we've gotten so domesticated that we look at a person who can spend 90 days in the woods as like a, a, a cultural hero. So that's kind of scary. It's a bit like Hunger Games level weird, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So when you bring that up, it just, that's what comes up for me is like, of course, we feel uncomfortable when we go in the woods. I'm the same way Son of uh, because I didn't grow up that way. And because the environment of the wolf is threatening to the Chihuahua, even though the Chihuahua is genetically a wolf, <laughs> not physically one anymore. And even though, you know, you and I come from stock that was once hunter gatherers living on the landscape, we are so adapted to the artificial environment Dude. and we are essentially like artificial. We, you and I have a foot in the pre digital world, but a foot in the digital world. And it makes it very strange to walk away from that um, tether that keeps us connected and our safety line back to warm dry food shelter all those things that we associate with the artificial world so um i always tell people look like don't feel like you have to go too far too fast this is going to be it took a lot of generations to get here it's going to take a lot of generations to get back mm. you no know, you know you can't do it all in one lifetime and the other thing is is that those shows like alone what's artificial about those is 
humans don't naturally live by themselves or as a couple in the woods. It's just not natural. We live as 30 to 50 people together on mm. an intact, unbroken landscape. So the idea that we're going to try to do this, and by the way, the places that are wilderness today are the least hospitable places in the world. So keep that in mind. Like, Where do human beings, natural human beings who hunt and gather want to live? They need to live in fertile areas with high food production. So we need to live in all the places where all the cities are. That's why the cities are there. Rivers, mm -hmm. coastal estuaries. The mountains were wilderness then and they're wilderness now because you can't set up a life there very easily mm -hmm. because it doesn't produce or yield what we need. So that's why those places are still wilderness today. <laughs> Otherwise, there would be lots of people there and farms there and all that stuff. So yeah. we put all that stuff uh, where we always did. And, and so those places now aren't intact, which means if you wanted to do an experiment, like let's say you had an experiment of like, I want to get a group, a foraging group of 50 people, and we're going to go try to live naturally on the landscape. It's like where there's people in all those places and cities and towns and, and those places have been exploited and broken up. And now they're all private property and you can't do mm. it anymore. Mm. So it's too much to expect a domesticated person with maybe a small family to go live off in inhospitable mountains and live off the land that will beat your body down because mm. it's not natural. So then we think, Oh, that's too hard. Well, it is too hard. Mm. It was a lot easier when you were 50 people, you know, living in the Pacific Northwest on the coast or living in the Crescent Valley on the Nile, you know, when it was a fertile Valley, like that was a lot different than us trying to go into the wilderness today. God damn. I love these distinctions that you're bringing up. It's so clear when I hear it shared with me, for one, as far as looking at those shows, I didn't really think of it in that way that they're attempting to live in a way in which like we come from, but yet their celebrities are like, Oh my God, in our eyes, like oh, wow. $500,000. Mm -hmm. But then also talking about, okay, well, that show was also created and made and produced and all that, but that's not necessarily how it used to be because you would have had a tribe. And then taking it More into fertile the, grounds. Yeah. And then looking at where they would have been living versus mm -hmm. like where they're dropping those people in. They're like putting them in like the worst of the worst places. Some yeah. folks, I think, get like a lucky spot. Um, but that's just luck. And maybe that but would having one it. moose stumble by is different than having 50,000 bison stumble by. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you know, where you live, for instance, there's a big elk hunting community, right? So mm -hmm. people go up into the mountains to hunt elk. Well, prior to Europeans coming to this continent, elk were not restricted to the mountains. They were all in the lowlands too. They were across the entire country. Dude. There was elk almost yep. everywhere, right? Yep. The amount of the, a lot of people have no concept of the passenger pigeon. I don't know how familiar you are with that animal. It's one of the animals that we've Highly. caused to go extinct. Okay. Mm -hmm. What, what this kind of thought, I, I'm, I'm not a, 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 you know, a biologist here. And so, or, or especially not an ornithologist. So I, you know, I'll give you just the rough of it. This animal went extinct because it turns out you, it can't survive as a hundred or 200 or 500 individuals. It needs to be like a million individuals for one to survive, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So there was a pigeon here, but think more like uh, all the pigeons in North America are feral birds that came from basically out of the middle East. But uh, if you have doves, morning doves, that's closer to what the passenger pigeon was, except they flew in great flocks. The flocks only in North America. The flocks were so great that when they would fly over your town, it might darken the sky for a day or two days or three days. Whoa. They would fire cannons into the sky filled with shot or broken shells or rocks and just knock hundreds of birds out of the air and people would eat them, you know, and sell them. <laughs> oh my them. God, wow. When they would find where they would nest, hunters would go out and just, you know, with the blunderbuss and just blast birds. They were so abundant that it's almost incomprehensible. We're talking tens of millions of birds going over head for days, right? Mm -hmm. Rivers of birds overhead. That bird's now extinct. Well, think about how much biomass that is right? You think about how many elk there were. Now we have some animals like our white-tailed deer. There's more of them now than there used to be, or coyotes. Mm -hmm. There's more than there used to be because they filled in the areas mm -hmm. that other species were, or because of the habitat we've created, but largely, you know, the bison gone, the, the elk largely gone, the, mm -hmm. these, the, so 
people lived in a way where there was in a place where there was much more abundance than today in the wild world. So that's why mm. w- when you see people trying to go out and do this on the landscape, it's a lot harder and especially harder to do it with a big group. Um, there was a lot more food, but also people were really good at cultivating more of it. So they learned how to, through their harvesting processes, create more abundance. So when Mm -hmm. Europeans got to North America, they were like, what an Eden, look at how undisturbed it is. It was like, no, the whole thing's been gardened by native people. It's a wild garden. They had created tremendous abundance here that the Europeans thought, because they had already logged out Europe. They had already basically withdrawn all of the resources from the sort of collective eco-bio bank account you know mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. they came here and they were like oh unexploited resources it's like no cultivated by these peoples who mm. appeared to be gone because of smallpox you know who appeared to be gone because of disease so they thought oh this is the the place god has given us it's like well not it's not exactly how that went down wow. um, but anyway yeah we don't really have a perception of how abundant nature it, it's kind of we see a little bit of it when we watch some of like the you know David Attenborough documentaries and you'll see places where there's like a gazillion birds on an island or something. It's like, wow, look at all that abundance. Mm-hmm. That was the earth before. Mm-hmm. We have mm-hmm. spent it all up like a kid with a trust fund. We've mm-hmm. spent it all up. And so now when you're out in nature, you're dealing with kind of the dregs of what's left. It seems like that even growing up in Colorado when I was younger, seeing all the herds of elk as I would drive from like one town to the next town. Now I can go back there. I don't see any elk in the fields. Now I move out to Idaho and we're in like a super small town. And I see, you know, four or five bucks on the way back just in the neighborhood. But yet the towns or the cities have pushed all of this wildlife out into the mountains. But yet the abundance has also been reduced. I noticed it with um, insects here in Maine. It used to be in the summertime, Mm -hmm. the whole front of your car, the grill, just everything would be splattered insects from driving around. Mm -hmm. Now it's like, whoa, the insect biomass anecdotally appears to be so much lower than it used to be. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of like, oh no, that's not, that feels like a bad direction. Mm -hmm. Now, here's where it gets really interesting to me talking about this digital world. My impression is that the that the people who really shape the policies of the world, I don't think there's ever been a moment where it's been so obvious that there are top down agendas at a world level than it is right now, because we see things rolling out from country to country to country in the same way with the same talking points. It's like, okay, there's definitely top down agendas. And a lot of the environment like the. Green New Deal slash like um, greening of the world. There's, there's gonna, we're gonna see a massive movement of rewilding the world. Mm. That is awesome. Like when I saw David Attenborough's last documentary, he goes specifically in the second half of it's about rewilding the world. I mean, I had a podcast called Rewild Yourself. I yep. love this idea. Yep. The problem is as this rolls out, so everybody is starting to participate in this green revolution, right? electric cars and recycling and oh we got to get off of meat and only on to play there's all this like stuff Mm -hmm. happening right the problem here we're going to see it's going to take people a a little while to realize that what's been foisted on them it's they're going to realize oh it's just that there's no place for people in it the policies are going to be such that people are going to get excluded from that Mm -hmm. and they want there there's going to be this thing of people all living in these stack and pack cities And you can see what's happening to our sovereignty into our natural rights as they Mm -hmm. diminish. I think people are going to find that what's expected of them is a very automatonic, automatronic uh, life in an urban environment where nature, where everything's painted green, but you don't necessarily have access to the world in the way that you and I do currently today. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I'm all for rewilding the world, but I think more most important is rewilding people. But it mm. seems like what people are going to do is go more tech mm-hmm. and then just leave the environment alone kind of an idea. And it's like, what made the earth abundant? See, human beings are like beavers. Like you brought up beavers before. Mm-hmm. Man, people, people still argue whether or not animals have intelligence. It blows my mind. It's like, Watch beavers. Beavers absolutely radically transform the landscape. So anybody who makes the argument, well, humans change the landscape. It's like, yeah, so do beavers. Lots of things change the landscape. Mm -hmm. It's okay to change the landscape if it's improving the landscape for everybody. So when a beaver comes in and dams up, there's a, I've got beavers in my backyard here. 
and I've got a very small brook. It's at its widest. It's like this wide and maybe this deep, mm -hmm. but it goes down and turns into a two acre pond where they've dammed it up. Mm -hmm. Now otters come and herons come and ducks come and deer come and moose come and bear come and all this wildlife because they've created and stored all this water, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So they are changing the landscape in a positive way. Well, it's their role in nature. Mm -hmm. Like trout rely on beavers to create water for them to be in. Like my belief is that the role of humans in the ecosystem is to create more and better and more abundant habitat for all the other creatures by living our natural lifestyle. Mm -hmm. The problem is when we live an artificial lifestyle, we actually subtract from all of it. Now everybody's convinced that's all we do. And so if you want to go out and do things on the landscape, like I'll have people be like, you need to stop foraging the milkweed. You're taking it all away from the monarch butterflies. It's like, dude, if you even knew how much I'm spreading milkweed, mm -hmm. when I go harvest wild rice, you're taking from the animals. Every time I take a wild rice, I inadvertently through the foraging process, plant wild rice <laughs> and it becomes more abundant. Yeah. Humans in a foraging lifestyle actually create more biomass and more abundance for all of the animals to benefit. That's mm -hmm. what North America was when Europeans got here. Mm -hmm. But now people think that humans are bad for the environment. And so what they're going to do is restrict more and more and more. Like one of the things that the people of this continent were doing that was so powerful for the landscape is burning it. Hey, we, we are got in our fire season going on right now. You have so fire smoky. season going because yeah. there's fuel on the ground. Yep. So people imagine sometimes like one of the things that that a person who doesn't heavily research and then practice this stuff, you just wouldn't know or think about, but yep. is obvious when somebody says it. You would imagine that human beings would be on the landscape and naturally, and then they would run out of food or hunting, you know, would, would start to get bad and they would move on. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, oh, they got to follow the bison or whatever. That's partially true. But another way to look at it would be human beings would run out of firewood. We didn't have metal axes or saws. So when you got stone axes, you're mostly going to be burning dead wood that you can break off or pick up or carry from wherever. Mm -hmm. When that starts to run out, you go to the next place, right? Mm -hmm. Well, when you do that, you're first of all, you're taking the fuel off the ground so that these wildfires don't rage out of control. Mm -hmm. And as you break off lower dead dry branches, you're opening up airflow, you're creating more habitat, you're making it easier to move through. Mm -hmm. Another thing they would do is set fires that would burn landscapes and reset succession on the landscape. But some a lot of trees, especially big, healthy, mature trees would survive those fires, they even be adapted to those fires. So you get onto a landscape where it's like, wow, it's so cool how naturally there's all these big old hickory nut trees here. It's like, no, not naturally. It's because that was a managed landscape with fire and those hickories survived that. And it cleaned out everything else. And that all that nut mast would fall down and that would bring all this wildlife. And then humans would come back to that place every year for the harvest. And that burning is how we managed it. I spoke to a Diné woman recently. She told me that their people believe that there should be 10 trees per acre. Now, if you walked out into that wilderness you were talking about and you measured mm -hmm. how many trees are on an acre, you might come back and be like, whoa, dude, there's 35,000 trees on an acre here. And they're all okay. thin saplings competing and fighting and nothing's growing abundantly and nothing's producing what it could produce. Yeah. Because just like the landscape needs beavers to keep water on it, it needs people with our unique thing about us that makes us different than all the other animals, fire. And we're supposed to be bringing that to the landscape. What we're doing now is instead we're going, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. And then we build up fuel on the landscape and then we lose everything to outrageous wildfires. And then we try to blame that on climate change as yeah. if that has anything to do with the climate because yeah. it doesn't, but mm -hmm. they love to sell that idea. Oh my God, the world's on fire panic. You need to go into the digital world. Yep. There you See go. what's happening. It's such there a trick. So I really believe in human beings being back on the landscape, doing our job, which is interacting with the landscape, interacting with species, creating abundance. That's how we get the world back, not by pulling people out of it. Mm -hmm. So if we do this rewild the landscape, pull people away, the landscape without humans doesn't do as well. We're an important keystone species, in my opinion. And then if you're all shacked up in the city and not even on the landscape, well, then it's going to do what it does. Yeah. So I hear you talking about stewardship and what comes to mind is also like conservation. And then I know there is an argument with certain groups of people that, like you're saying, 
um, are against things such as hunting. They're against fishing. Why? You're killing animals. You're eating animals. Yet that's where we come from as hunter gatherers. So what role um, does hunting play in conservation as far as, say, land and animal management? Because you were talking about this Eden, right? But yet it was also being managed or stewarded by other inhabitants, other humans. So like what role does hunting- well, In the modern landscape, hunting is plays the primary role in species management. Um, it's a very imperfect system. So I'm speak like when I talk about indigenous stewardship of the land, mm -hmm. I don't want to conflate that with modern conservation because they, okay. mm -hmm. the level of sophisticated, you know, it's just so much more sophisticated, right? It'd be like yeah. a brain surgeon, you know, versus like civil war era surgery, like not even on the same level. Right. Mm -hmm. But currently, almost all of the money for the conservation of wildlife comes through hunting dollars. Uh, it's pretty interesting. Uh, it goes back to the 1940s and uh, something called um, the, I want to say it's the Restoration and Wildlife Act. Um, Pittman Robinson is its common name, uh, named after the two people who put the bill forward. Um, but basically 10% or 11% of all the money depends on what exactly we're talking about, but 10 to 11% of all the money that's spent on hunting equipment, that'd be firearms, ammunition, bows, arrows, things like that. Um, all that money, 10%, it's a pretty big tax, all goes back to fund the federal government and states uh, for all their conservation and all their biological work. So if you got on like Google Scholar and you wanted to read articles on, hey, I want to read a, a study on white-tailed deer, that's hunting money that funded that study. Hmm. When you hear about them going to deal with invasive species or helping to restore eagles, like any of those kind of things, that's hunting dollars that are funding that. Mm -hmm. So people love to focus on, oh my God, you're killing animals. It's like, well, so are you though. Mm -hmm. So is everybody because we eat yeah. animals. And the idea like we're going to become vegetarian is so funny. It's like, yeah. What part of hunter gatherers <laughs> aren't you getting here? Like the yeah. idea that we're just gatherers, it's never been done. Yeah. You know, veganism, just for the sake of saying it, is is never been tested on any wide scale. There's never been a reproducing population of humans that have ever done it. Mm. It's it's so preposterous that you'd be told you have to do this mm. when there's never been a group of people who's done it and then reproduced. <laughs> We've never even seen that happen. It's like completely mm. new, untested theory. Yep. And what we do know from anthropology is that for 300,000, and archaeology, for 300,000 years, human beings have been hunting and eating animals. And, you know, I had... um. Recently, I was speaking to um, the carnivore MD, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, a pretty. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that pretty, Saladino? Yeah, yeah. Paul Saladino. Saladino. Okay. I love that his last name has salad in it. Salad. I, yeah, really, yeah, I saw that. I, shit. I was just like, that's such a that's trip. It's just dude. like the cosmic giggle, you know? Yeah. Uh, but he he takes that perspective of, you know, the opposite approach of vegans, the carnivore approach, like mm -hmm. eating all animal food. Now, I don't um, subscribe to that at all. I really believe in omnivory. But I, what I really love about Paul's work is it's like really in your face to, you know, it's like a pointing out the importance of animal food in our diet. Like we need it. Yeah. Now, a lot of people who are against hunting are still eating domestic animals and they're the ones participating in that awful I, ghoulish diet. Mm -hmm. Guilty, mm -hmm. go to restaurants, like sometimes yeah. guilty, but most, yeah. you know, for the most part, the meat that I eat at home, it's like meat that I hunt. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'll go further than that. In the last six years, I've I've bought bacon maybe once or twice to add to things. Wow. Uh, and like recently, I was given some crab legs from Alaska, or somebody might give somebody gave me some caribou meat. Mm -hmm. So while there's still wild meats that I didn't personally gather, but otherwise, for for the last six years, all the meat in our house and all the fish in our house that's come from hunting and fishing. Mm -hmm. So we're sort of not really part of that. But when I I'm not judging people for it. I'll go to a restaurant and eat that ghoulish diet. But when I say ghoulish, what I mean is if you went like Lord of the Rings, right? You're like thinking about those like orcs and like mm -hmm. how horrific and twisted they have become. And if you remember in the, the lore of the film, they were elves once who'd become twisted and evil. Mm -hmm. And you look at how they live and what they eat. 
It's like, if you were going to design a diet for them, it would be that factory farm tortured domesticated animals living in pens and cages stacked on each other, shitting on each other, getting kicked around inside the factory farm before they're killed. Like mm -hmm. it's just pumped with chemicals and like that ghoulish diet. Mm -hmm. The idea that like I shouldn't hunt because people go, you don't need to anymore because there's this alternative. It's like, oh yeah, the ghoul diet. Like mm -hmm. I want to get on that gorish yeah. thing. Yeah. What are you talking about? And then they'll say, well, it's not sustainable. Not everybody in the world can hunt. It's like, dude, only 1% of the population in America is even hunting. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? Like, I'm not saying the whole world should do that. I, mm -hmm. I'm just doing it. You mm -hmm. know, I'm sharing it with other people. There's room, but also it's important that people understand that it's biologists who determine take. So it's not just willy nilly Elmer Fudd out in the woods shooting all the elk. You get a tag and the number of tags that are issued are based on the population dynamic. So if the number of animals is lower, the number of tags given is lower because what we do as hunters is, is called compensatory mortality. Hmm. So compensatory mortality means if the population of elk is this big and no matter what happens, this many are going to die. The number of tags issued has to exist inside this limited window of animals that were already going to die of age, of cold, of wolves, mm. whatever it is. Mm -hmm. That's called compensatory mortality. What we don't practice anymore, but humans did on a large scale, I'll get to that in a second, was called additive mortality. That's where you're taking more than would have died and you're actually eating into the bank account of wildlife. Mm -hmm. We're not okay. doing that. That's illegal in the United States, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It's happening still in other parts of the, you know, you might watch a movie like Seaspiracy and be like, oh my God, additive mortality to sharks. It's like not here in the United States. It's not maybe mm -hmm. in some other parts of the world, but we're not doing that anymore. Mm -hmm. That's not what's happening here. When somebody's out fishing, when we're not doing that mm -hmm. um, largely. Yeah. Now in the past, people were doing that, but because you could sell that meat into the market, so it was actually the non-hunters that were really responsible because they were buying all and eating all that meat. Mm, Just mm -hmm. like who's really responsible, the factory farms or the people buying from the factory farms? Like everybody's got to, <laughs> you know, everybody's got to take yeah. a little responsibility here. Yeah. The passenger pigeon went extinct because people were selling dead passenger pigeons, not because mm. the people who were shooting a few to eat in their household. It was yeah. the people shooting thousands to sell them into the market to the people who wouldn't go out and hunt them themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. So hunters have are not the problem. And in fact, hunters have been contributing massively. You know, people just don't understand, like it gets real weird in Africa when you find out like, oh, it's actually those, those like rich white guys who want to go shoot an elephant mm -hmm. are actually the ones funding all the conservation of elephants because that 30, 40, $50,000 they spend on that, most of that money stays right there to help yeah. the ele the young elephants come up and to make sure that there are safe places for elephants to be mm -hmm. and to make sure that the that all of the anti-poaching efforts are funded in the national parks like that's all hunter money mm -hmm. but it's really easy to be like what a scumbag why would he do that unless you yeah. zoom out and you go oh he might he might be a scumbag and his motives might be bad but his money is actually funding the conservation of elephants or rhinos or whatever it is so mm -hmm. hunters are currently funding are, are, are basically paying the bills for wildlife conservation. And that is the end of part one of two. But before we part ways today, I do want to make sure that you're able to get in touch with Daniel. So I'm going to add in this clip where he shares his information so you can reach out to him. Yeah. Where can people find you? Where, where can they reach out to you? I'm pretty active on Instagram uh, at Daniel Vitalis. And I, my uh, show has a account as well at wild dot fed mm -hmm. um that stuff's all easy to find if you know danielvitalis.com wild-fed.com um and then i have a tv show on outdoor channel which um i know a lot of people don't have cable now so we always send people to a, a streaming app called friendly f-r-n-d-l-y it's like the word friendly without vowels mm -hmm. and uh, they stream outdoor channel so you can see our tv show it's all about hunting fishing foraging food reconnecting with the landscape and then my podcast wild fed which you know is a sort of a nature-based show but we do get into some kind of interesting topics topics from time to time, you know, that kind of touch around the things we're talking about. So yeah, yeah I really appreciate anybody's support. Um, but more than anything, I just want to say thanks for sharing your platform today. And Okay, that's it. That's all we have for part one of two. Remember to check out part two next Wednesday. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a review, hit the old like button, subscribe to the show and share the show with everyone you know. If you'd like to go on the Vision Hunters journey together, you can find me on Instagram at the Vision Hunters podcast and also at Cody Allen story. Once again, welcome to the Vision Hunters podcast. Peace out.